Today on Market Journal, running a farm is a full-time job times 10. And in today's climate, stress can get out of hand. We'll look at some ways to cope. Plus, acres are unplanted and markets are volatile. Our analyst tells us where he sees prices going. And many gas buyers are pumped about the EPA lifting certain fuel restrictions just in time for the summer driving season. Hear what it means for agriculture. This week's edition of Market Journal starts right now. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hey everyone, I'm Troy Moling and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. The year is moving along, we are officially into summer. If you can believe it, glad you could be with us today. And starting off the broadcast, being a farmer always comes with stress, but it seems like this year with the weather and market uncertainty, the anxiety is even more noticeable. Susan Harris Broomfield is a Nebraska Extension educator focused on rural health, wellness, and safety. We spoke at a recent AgriAbility conference to get an idea of how serious farm depression and suicide is. Unfortunately, it is quite prevalent. Uh, it's an industry where there are a lot of pressures, the weather, the un, you know, unknown markets, um, family issues, all of these things can, can collapse onto a farmer or a rancher and uh, it's, it's one of the higher rated suicide occupations. Do you find that it's hard for people in the ag community to reach out for help? Absolutely, and for several reasons. Okay. The two main reasons are stigma and accessibility. You know, in Nebraska in general, there is still a definite stigma with mental health. And even the word mental brings up negative images. Um, when it's health, you know, it's just like physical health, there is mental health and we have to take care of both. But it's difficult for us to, to think about that in Nebraska and especially with our farmers and ranchers who are tough, they're strong, they're used to taking care of themselves. They're not used to asking for help. They don't want to ask for help. And more importantly, with that stigma, is that they would have to be seen, you know, their, their pickup or their vehicle would be in front of the counselor's office and, and they, don't, they don't want that. They don't think it's, you know, a healthy thing to have happen to them. How do we go about changing that perception? Oh gosh, I think more information out there is crucial. I think the more we educate and more people understand that mental health is just like physical health. We all have issues, we all need to deal with them. Um, and even if you, if you have to start with your doctor, you know, because accessibility is really difficult in Nebraska. If you go to your doctor with a physical condition, it might very well be related to a mental issue um, going on. And I'm hoping that doctors out there will be asking the correct questions to, to dig into these issues. What are some signs that family members can look for? For depression? Yeah. Um, definitely changes in mood, changes in behavior, changes in the way that a person goes about their day. Are they able to live and love and laugh like they used to, or do they seem like they're more in a box and more isolated and not doing their social things that they used to go out and do? You know, if they had a coffee club every week, are they still doing that or are they kind of just being a hermit at home? Those kinds of things. And for family members left behind after, after a suicide, do you find that they're at a higher risk for suicide themselves or just uh, more problems in their life in general? Yes, and I can't remember the statistic offhand, but there is a statistic that says that if uh, the, the family member left behind does not get help or support within a certain amount of time, their risk is much higher for suicide and for mental health and physical health issues. It's really important, you know, people don't think about that when someone dies, and especially by suicide, everybody's there all at once to help, and that's great, support is great, but then they, everybody goes home and they kind of forget about this person and they, and they leave that issue behind. And I think it's important to just keep checking up with that, that person and make sure they have a support system and hopefully even some professional help if necessary. What are some resources that Extension provides to help with suicide, depression, things like that? 
Well, at Extension, we have recently formed a mental health work group to work on just collecting every resource that we are aware of. We're bringing in outside uh, sources to our work group, so it's not just Extension people. And we've put together a list that you can find on our website at extension.unl.edu. And so if you were to look into that site, you would find this list for, it's called Staying Connected During Tough Times. And it lists resources that many people don't know about, like our Rural Response Hotline. Um, it offers attorneys, financial help, um, counselors, mediators, just all kinds of issues and maybe some free vouchers for services for, for certain people. Um, so that's a great one. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, the Vice, uh, sorry, the Veterans Crisis Line, uh, Boys Town. And then there's another one that a lot of people do not know about. It's called LOSS, yeah. L-O-S-S. -S, mm -hmm. And that's for local outreach to suicide survivors. And that's for people who have suffered a suicide in their life. And this particular group has teams of individuals, professionals around the state, about 10 of them, I think. And they are uh, sent out to, to talk with people who have lost someone due to suicide. And they are the best support you can imagine. Thanks again to Susan. Difficult topic, but something that needs to be talked about. We've posted a link to extension and information for Nebraska loss on our website. That's marketjournal.unl.edu. Time for markets now, and Jeff Peterson, president of Heartland Farm Partners, is our analyst this week. He offered his thoughts on pricing, challenges in this market, and some ways to manage risk. Jeff also says there are different market phases that we'll need to be on the lookout for. Here's what he thinks could happen. There are going to be different phases to this market. In the phase right now, what it's trying to sort out is it's really trying to understand where are the acres and the yield going to be, which really means all about supply. And if you think back, this kind of the price action really kind of really took off at the June report. And I think we'll look back on that and really kind of see that that was a turning point where in that report we reduced acres, we reduced yield, which meant we reduced some of our excessive stocks. And at that point the market goes, oh, this might be real. It isn't just a threat, it's real. And now it got rid of those excess stocks. Now it's trying to decide, does it need to accelerate in price faster to now start looking at rationing demand? And that's the kind of how I think this summer is going to play out. It's going to be the realization of trying to get prices high enough to make sure we have enough stocks when we get all the way out to August of 2020. And let's talk about some of the biggest challenges that you're seeing in this market. I think some of the biggest challenges is that we're getting a point where we're seeing more volatility in the market. Market bounces up, market comes back down, and what that does in amongst everybody is it creates emotion. And these are emotions that we haven't had a chance to feel, and some of these are price emotions above where our profitability levels are on corn more so than beans. But what that does, Troy, is it makes it really, really hard to know when to sell. And it makes it really scary because it comes back to these two fears again. The fear of missing out on a higher price, but then also if you're in an area where you had a lot of prevent plant, which isn't so much in Nebraska, but in other states, you have to really deal with but the fear of what if I don't produce it. And those are the emotions and challenges that we're going to have to deal with for the rest of this marketing season. Gotcha. And Jeff, let's talk about pricing for a minute. So June WASD shaved about $3 million off the corn acreage, looking like that's a, that's a low number. So that raised prices. What are some scenarios you see for where prices may go? Yeah, and I think one thing we want to look at is kind of what is the current situation factoring in. If we take December futures, December 2019 futures around the 450 area, what that's pricing in is about a prevent plant number of about 4 million acres and a yield of 166. Now I think what we have to do is talk about where could those prevent plant numbers go and where could the yield go to. Well, if we wanted to take prices a dollar higher, what would it need to be? So if we wanted to go from 450 to 550 on December futures, then we have to start talking about 7 million acres of prevent plant, and then we have to talk about bringing that yield from 166, bring that down to 160, and then we start talking about 550 plus. And what are we looking at with soybeans? Whole lot going on with soybeans. What do you see? Yeah, that's a hard one because in addition to that, we've got the situation with China. We've got African swine fever out there affecting our demand. We've got a big crop that came off out of South America. So what we're dealing with right now, as I say, unfortunately, and this is, doesn't feel real good to say, but beans honestly are probably higher than they really should be on price. 
If we wanted to talk about getting the November futures price back up over $10 on the way to 1050, then what we really have to talk about is probably 5 million acres of prevent plant, and we probably have to look at reducing the yield about three bushels the acre. I think both of those are possible scenarios, but that's really what we'd have to see if we wanted to move these prices up into that area. And what advice do you have for livestock producers? Anything they can lock in right now, or do you see some animals being sold at a lower weight? What do you think? Yeah, and that's, that's always a tough one because when the individual who's producing grain and corn is benefiting, it's hard for the livestock side. But I think you do have to look at locking some prices in on the corn side. You have to look at either getting the bushels bought or another alternative, and I think this is a, is a valid one too, Developing some type of maximum price contract, whether through wherever you're buying those bushels for or using a call option where if the market goes higher, it still allows you to have your price locked in, but yet if prices would surprisingly drop back lower, it would allow you to pick those bushels up cheaper. But I do think you need to be locking your prices in, especially if you're looking to place something a feedlot down the road and you don't have those bushels of corn bought. All right, we'll, we'll get out the uh, Jeff Peterson crystal ball right now. Any projections as to where you see corn and soybean prices finally settling? Well, I, I think what we have to look at is that um, in regard to where the highs come in, I, I don't think we're going to see the highs on the move that we're in right now. I think this market isn't going to be like what we saw in 2012 where the market ran straight up. I think it's going to be one more like a 1995 that ultimately carried out for some more time and, and really needed to better understand where the acres were at and where the yields were at. I think we've really got a legitimate shot of over $5 on corn, you know, but that doesn't mean, and I want to put a big asterisk on sure. this, Troy, if that doesn't mean that we don't make sales. It said, I think that's possible. Over on the bean side, I think it's really a little bit too early to sell or to, to, to ultimately tell, mm -hmm. but I think what we probably have the possibility of getting back up over $10 there too, but that one's a little bit tougher one to make a decision on. Finally, managing risk, always important with a market like this, extremely important. What's, what are some things that producers need to consider in that area? Yeah, I think as we think about managing risk, the biggest thing is that it's, it's fun to have a market that's going higher, but what we have to realize, we really have to realize that at some point we do have to make sales. And the thing that I would say is that I would be using hedge to arrive contracts, so you're just setting the futures price, because I do think we'll see better basis levels down the road, and I do think we'll see that carry improve. But anytime I do make a sale in here, and I think you should have sales on here, even if you're thinking the market could go higher, you need to go ahead and add some type of call strategy to those. The reason you need to do that is to give you the ability to, one, be able to feel good about the prices going higher, but secondly, it puts a good floor price in for you. I'd rather go that way than buying puts. But if you said, you know what, I don't want to sell and buy a call, then your next best alternative would be to come in and buy puts. That would give you your downside protection. Now, there's another group of bushels that we have to think about, though, and we haven't thought about those for a while. And that's those bushels up and beyond your insured. That gap between your expected and your insured. Mm -hmm. I think we're getting to a point in here where we should consider not making sales on those. We don't want to have those sold, but we do need to consider buying puts against those because we know at some point down the road, this market will roll over and it will do so when we least expect it. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Josh Maples, a livestock economist from Mississippi State University. If you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, email us or get in touch on social media and I'll pass your question along. Time now for this week's trivia question. And as I said to top off the show, it's summertime. So with warm weather and longer days, that means it's time for farmers markets too. And that's our question today. Approximately how many farmers markets are in Nebraska? Is the answer 100, 125, 150, or is it 175? Make your guess and I'll have the answer after Al's forecast. And hey, that's what time it is. Al Dutcher is here with our forecast. And Al, after a week of spotty shower activity, what can we expect in our latest forecast? Well, Troy, we did see scattered shower activity throughout the week as we had many impulses moving across the central United States. And so that scattered thunderstorm activity we talked about last night actually filled in a little bit more across Nebraska than was initially forecasted. And we did have some respectable totals in this last seven day period. Uh, the heaviest of the totals and cumulative for this last week were coming out of the southwestern portions of the western half of south central Nebraska, 
widespread one and a half to three and a half inch totals were reported. Then we've seen pockets across southeast, the Panhandle and north central Nebraska where we've seen localized precipitation amounts in the three quarters of an inch to two inch range and then isolated totals uh, across northeast uh, portions of west central Nebraska that were significantly lower than that. And then we did see the severe weather really crank up as we got into these last two days as we had a trough in the western United States finally making progress into the central plains and we expected that that severe weather will continue at least for the first half of the weekend across portions of eastern Nebraska before we start to see a change in the models and much more significant warmth starts to build in to much of the central and southern plains as we have a large trough that looks like it wants to lock into place across the western United States. So as we look at the upper air model today, we can see that this trough that has been bringing us to severe weather is still to our west and we're going to go through another round of severe weather as we've got a southwest flow in the upper atmosphere, surface low sitting basically in southeastern Colorado, bringing that moisture toward the north from the Gulf. And we would expect that most of the severe weather will be across eastern Nebraska with northeastern Nebraska being basically in the zone for the worst of the severe weather. And then by tomorrow, this trough starts to progress to the east. A series of low pressure systems at the surface stack up from Texas all the way into western Wisconsin. That will keep severe weather activity across Kansas. And some of this will probably fall into east central southeast Nebraska before we start to see that trough progress toward the Great Lakes and we start to see ridging building into the central plains. And then on Monday, the, basically the surface surface lows will remain down in Texas, high pressure over the central Rockies. That will leave most of the thunderstorm activity to the east of Nebraska and will start to fill in significantly across the eastern Corn Belt. On Tuesday, we start to see the ridge building in. A little weak wave moves across Texas, so we see the surface low located in the Texas Panhandle. That will keep most of the moisture concentrated in portions of eastern Oklahoma and Texas. We should be fairly dry with a warming trend as I mentioned and then that becomes more significant as this upper air uh, trough begins to build significantly in the west. Although we do show surface low pressures developing one in west central portions of Kansas, it looks like there are going to be moisture starves as the primary moisture feed will be well to our east. And as we get into the day Thursday, we don't see a lot of movement in this uh, troughing pattern. So we get this southwest flow aloft. Again, surface lows along the front side of the Rocky Mountains, but there's just not a lot of moisture to work with with these systems. So although we are seeing some convective development in southeastern Nebraska, this is primarily going to be during the overnight hours, early morning hours, and that will push gradually toward the southeast as high pressure really starts to extend its focus across much of the Corn Belt. Again, Friday we see these low pressures shown to be developing along the front side of the Rocky Mountains, but again, no moisture for us to feed into this system, so it looks to be a fairly warm and dry forecast from about Tuesday through the following Friday and this looks like it's going to extend even farther as there's no signs of this trough breaking down. If we look at the 8 to 14 day forecast, we can kind of see that mode in play as above normal temperatures projected from next Thursday through the following Tuesday. It brings us right close to the 4th of July holiday and normal conditions basically in Texas as we see that one wave move toward the east. In terms of precipitation, below normal precipitation for the western high plains, above normal to our north. So overall, Troy, it looks like we are going to start to see a drier pattern and if the models are correct, pointing toward a thickness line of around 588 on the, and about the 4th of July would mean that we will start to see some 100 degree readings developing into the southwestern portion of the state. So overall, Enjoy this next week. It looks like much drier conditions after we get to this weekend. Thanks, Al. Back to trivia now, and this week our question was about farmers markets. We asked, how many farmers markets are in Nebraska? If you guessed A, then you are 100% correct, because that's the answer. There are approximately 100 farmers markets across the state that you can enjoy. Moving on, and it's been big news for agriculture at the federal level. The EPA recently limited restrictions on air quality reporting for producers as well as approving year-round sales of E15. And while the E15 news may seem like a big win for corn and ethanol, some are saying more can be done. Market Journal's Bill Dodd is here and Bill, what do these new EPA mandates mean for producers here? Thanks Troy. Now regulation is a necessity in any industry and in many instances it's a good thing when it comes to agriculture. However, it can sometimes be too much of a good thing. For instance, many producers saw the need to report the air emissions from their operations as a bit of regulatory overkill. Now that being said, many were very elated when EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler took action last week to amend the EPA's air emission reporting requirements. 
The amendments clarify that reporting of emissions from animal waste at farms is not required under the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. Now, this law was originally enacted by Congress as a national legislation for community safety. The law was designed to help local communities protect public health, safety, and environment from chemical hazards. For Nebraska ag producers, that meant day-to-day -day reporting of animal waste emissions. Nebraska U.S. Senator Deb Fisher had this to say on the recent change. Due to unnecessary federal regulations, our ag producers in Nebraska were facing worry and frustration about calculating emissions from animal waste. Now that the EPA administrator has officially implemented this rule, farmers and ranchers will have more regulatory certainty." End quote. Nebraska Farm Bureau President Steve Nelson recently joined me to discuss the original intent of the law and says, with the amendment in place, farmers and ranchers can get back to business as usual. Sure, and we've seen that, you know, over and over again. Uh, we've seen that relate to uh, fuel storage, those kinds of things where the federal government, uh, in an effort to address issues uh, for large producers, ended up uh, taking in uh, uh, smaller uh, producers and, and areas that really weren't intended to be regulated. But one of the good things I think that we see with this administration is that they are really taking a practical approach to looking at, you know, do the rules that, that are being implemented uh, touch the right people? Obviously there's areas where we need regulation, but, but the unintended consequences of some of the previous activities ha it just hasn't made any sense it is really what it comes down to and so the practical aspect of, of uh, what's happening here I think is very good and probably the most important way to think about how we do regulations in the future is that that uh, obviously there are issues from time to time that we want to deal with but we want to look at it in a way that that really accomplishes a purpose that doesn't go beyond the purpose or the intent of the original law. But for traditional, normal farming practices, I think that there's some, uh, that there should be at least a confidence level here that, that you can move forward and do what you do. Continuing to produce uh, food for uh, feeding people around the world, uh, that's a great thing and I think people can continue to, uh, to do that as they have been. And speaking of the EPA scaling back regulations, last week President Trump made a stop in Council Bluffs, Iowa to tout the implementation of year-round sales of E15. With Iowa and Nebraska both ranking first and second respectively in terms of statewide ethanol production, both states have been pushing for year-round E15 sales for quite some time. Now that was finally made possible in part to a 2018 directive from President Trump to the EPA. It was designed to remove barriers on the use of blended gasolines with up to 15% ethanol during the summer driving season and to reform compliance systems to increase transparency and deter price manipulation. While Trump did make good on his campaign promises to fight for year-round E15 sales, the EPA under his administration has approved record numbers of small refinery exemptions and renewable identification numbers to petroleum producers. Nebraska Ethanol Board Administrator Roger Berry tells me year-round E15 sales as it stands now equates to a sizable political victory for the ethanol industry. But more could be done at the federal level to make it a meaningful boost for corn and ethanol producers in Nebraska. So basically what the law says is that any refinery that produces less than 75,000 barrels per day of fuel can request an exemption from the RFS and not have to blend ethanol in. Through the years they've been used very little and they were used for justifiable reasons. Here lately for 2016 and 2017 the EPA has been approving just about every exemption that's requested. We're also, now they are all refineries that are under that 75,000 barrels per day, but many of them are tied in with large conglomerates that are making billions of dollars in profits off of the driving consumer. So why should the farmers that are providing the corn for these ethanol plants take that hit when they're in, in dire straits right now economically and we have these, these uh, conglomerations that are making billions of dollars, the oil companies, I'll just come out and say it, the oil companies that are making billions of dollars in profits, and they're, they're requesting these exemptions. It just does not make sense. For 2016 and 2017, the exemptions that uh, were put out by the EPA has been a cut in 2.6 billion gallons. For 2018, there's right at about 40 exemptions waiting that the EPA has not approved yet. If they were to approve all those, we would be hurting really bad in, in number of gallons that would not be blended in to the uh, fuel supply in the United States. So while year-round sales are a resounding political victory, 
The hard dollars and cents will be won through the EPA and the criterion they use to select exemption applications in the future. Now, if you'd like to see more of my interview with Roger, you can find that on our YouTube and social media pages, but for now, I'll send it back to you, Troy. Thanks for all that, Bill. For our final story today, the glyphosate-resistant Palmer Amaranth Management Field Day was a huge success last year, and it's time to do it again. Now, soybean producers know that Palmer Amaranth is one of the most troublesome weeds out there, and Nebraska Extension Management Specialist Amit Jala is leading this field day and says attendees will find the event to be extremely useful. And we have some interesting projects, uh, for example, um, how best you can suppress uh, Palmer Amaranth uh, with uh, 15 inch versus 30 inch row spacing and herbicide program in uh, glyphosate and dicamba resistant soybean. We also have additional projects where we want to demonstrate how best you can control glyphosate resistant Palmer Amaranth uh, in uh, Enlist uh, as well as LE27 soybean. These are new soybean varieties coming to the market. Uh, there are multiple herbicide resistant. Glyphosate resistant Palmer Amaranth was found in Nebraska about three years ago and has been spreading to other parts of the state ever since. See, glyphosate resistant Palmer Amaranth is one of the problem weeds uh, in Nebraska, particularly in eastern and uh, west central part of the state. Uh, so growers have a problem and so they enjoyed looking at a uh, number of projects, how best uh, they can control glyphosate resistant Palmer Amaranth uh, in different type of soybean varieties. So that's why gro grower, growers learn a lot by attending this field day and they are expecting to learn more this year. The glyphosate-resistant Palmer Amaranth Management Field Day is happening Wednesday, July 10th in Carleton. Everything gets underway beginning at 9 a.m. Dr. Jason Norsworthy, a weed scientist from the University of Arkansas, will be the keynote speaker. Registration is free, but you'll need to do that online. Lunch will be provided too. All the information is right there on the screen and on the Market Journal website. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. Next week, we'll be joined by Pete McClymont with Nebraska Cattlemen. Hear how the industry is responding to the rise of meat alternatives on menus and in grocery stores. Plus, we'll look at some research focusing on growing corn in saturated soils. We'll have a whole lot more, too. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.